Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Welcome back to another episode of Resilient Minds 365. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Well, everyone, we have a wonderful guest with us today. We have Megan Key with us today. Who is Megan Key? Well, Megan Key is the founder and director of 2020 Arts, an organization that empowers their nonprofit partners with the tools, support, and skills necessary to co connect and engage with a different generation of donors online. With over 10 years of experience in the fine art industry, Megan believes in the power of visual art to create meaningful change in the social impact landscape. So with that said, we now have Megan Key. So Megan, how are you on this wonderful gloomy day? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, doing as well as I can be given the circumstances of the lockdown, but yes, yes, definitely. Because we're on a lockdown for, I guess it's 30 days. Correct. Right. Here in Toronto. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, that's another story for another day, but we will talk about <laughs> that. Yeah. Long we story. Will, we will make the most of it. We'll totally make the most of it. <laughs> but that said, um, Tell us a little bit more about your profession at 2020 Arts and what you do. Sure. So I founded 2020 Arts in May of 2018. Um, and after having worked in the fine art industry for, like you say, 10 years, um, I lost my brother in May of 2016 to an overdose. And that really changed up my whole life and made me rethink what it was that I was doing. And was I doing something that I felt really passionate and connected to? And the answer was no. Um, and so I, with my experience in the arts and my own lived experience with mental health, and of course my brother's passing um, and struggles with addiction, I wanted to be able to address these pressing social issues with a medium that I was very comfortable and familiar with, which is why I chose art. Um, and so I founded, like I said, 2020 Arts in May of 2018, having no idea what it was going to mean in my life or what it was going to be, had no idea I was gonna end up quitting my full-time job to do this full-time. Wow. Uh, but essentially what it started out as was a nonprofit that helps other charities and nonprofits produce meaningful campaigns to raise funds for their programs and services using art primarily as a vehicle. So the first project we did was called Life on the Line and it was a mental health awareness campaign in partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association Toronto mm -hmm. uh, where 20 unique poster designs were displayed across the TTC for a month and a half. Um, and all of those posters were available for sale where 80% of all those sales were donated to their programs. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then I quit my full-time job, started doing this full-time. And I think the organization has changed and evolved over the years. Um, but now what we're doing is we have a permanent store where artwork is being sold where percentage of sales are donated to a charity of the artist's choosing. Um, and we're also providing services, social media, digital engagement, website design, general design to nonprofits and charities. So it's changed a lot over the years, but that's a brief summation amazing that's amazing it's funny how life you know can just lead you into a new direction you know because of life situations you just never know where where you're going to end up in in the in the in your in your journey you know it's just kind of crazy yeah. so with, with that said so we're going to go into the mental health piece of this interview so tell us more about your mental health diagnosis and when you were diagnosed so uh, as, I, as I previously sort of mentioned, um, I actually haven't been officially diagnosed. Um, and this is something that has been, uh, it's, it's been a little bit shameful for me in some ways, because I think working in the mental health space is very common, obviously, to be diagnosed. It's very useful to be diagnosed. And I encourage anybody who's struggling to manage their symptoms to get diagnosed and to seek help. Um, however, I never went that traditional path. Mm -hmm. um, I had been struggling with my mental health since 
probably since I was about 15, um, had been struggling with manic highs and depressive lows, and I had no vocabulary to describe what I was going through. And so I felt like it was the personality flaw, as I'm sure so many people do. Um, didn't learn about mental health in elementary school, in high school, even in university. I had no idea what it was. So I had to learn all of that myself. Um, and I was not managing my symptoms, um, but I also didn't know that I could seek help. It was very, I felt very ashamed of what I was experiencing. And so I didn't feel like I could reach out for help. I thought that it made me weak in some way. Mm -hmm. And then about seven months after my brother's passing, I reached like a total breaking point. I was just, I could not deal with what I was going through anymore. And so I went to a walk-in and he prescribed me SSRIs. Um, after meeting with me just once, and I stared at that bottle over and over and over again, and I was going to take them. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then after the new year, something just changed in my life. And I don't know what it was, but I really started to go, okay, I'm going to do everything I can do within my own power to be able to mitigate my mental health symptoms before I take these SSRIs, because I'm feeling a little bit better and I'm feeling a little bit stronger. Um, and so that led me on an entirely new journey that helped me mitigate my mental health symptoms in a way that I don't feel like I need the diagnosis. And I've heard from somebody before that if you are managing your symptoms really well, you don't get the diagnosis. Um, and so I haven't been formally diagnosed. And I think that there's a little bit of shame to that, but I also think that the individual experiencing whatever mental health disorder it is, um, knows themselves best and has an idea of their lived experience and what they're going through. So for me, I don't call it bipolar disorder because I think that's the diagnosis. I experience manic highs and depressive lows. Okay. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So for some people who don't know, what is an SS, I think you said SSRI. What is yeah. an SSRI? For? So there it's antidepressants essentially. So the acronym, oh my gosh, something <laughs> I can't do it now, but it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, and it, it has many different effects. There's so many different SSRIs or antidepressants that are out there that people can take. Um, some work really well for people, some don't, and you have to go through a little bit of trial and error to find one that does, um, but I never ended up actually taking it. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so what, tell us a little bit more in detail about your mental health story of resilience, what you had to do, you know, when you had your, when your, you had your biggest breakdown, um, and what you had to do to overcome and actually come to the place where you are right now. Yeah. I mean, after my brother passed, I went through about seven months of just like absolute breakdown and agony. It was a really difficult time in my life. And one of the things that I kept doing was ruminating over and over the last week of his life, the day I got that phone call. And then the week afterwards and his funeral, I replayed that scenario over in my head a million times. And I was essentially making myself sick with my thoughts, but I didn't recognize that that's what I was doing necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day, it was about New Year's, about seven months after his passing, I just had this realization that for the past seven months, I had been thinking so much about the last two weeks of his life. And I hadn't spent any time thinking about the other 27 years of his life that I was so grateful to have had. Mm -hmm. um, and I recognized in myself that, and I'm not in any ways trying to say that your mental health is about perspective in any sort of way, but realizing that I had been focusing on the wrong thing the entire time after my brother's passing made me realize that the same thing was true about my mental health and that I wasn't and, it, and again, it's not about perspective necessarily, but was recognizing that recovery was possible for me. Because I think if you don't realize that recovery is possible and you think I'm never gonna get better, you're probably right. And so whatever perspective you end up taking on your recovery journey is going to help you mitigate the symptoms as you go. So I started to do everything. I started to exercise every day. I started to meditate every day. Um, I started eating better and that was just based on whatever it was I was learning at the time. And I think that healthy is like a shifting um, concept and targets. So I think that's right. a difficult one to pin down, um, but just kind of figuring out and becoming intuitive with myself and seeing what worked for me and what didn't. Um, I've been meditating for the past eight years, but I really took it seriously at any time I was feeling depressed instead of, you know, choosing other slightly less healthy coping mechanisms, I decided just to meditate. And so I started to become really conscious of my own thoughts. So when I became 
when I started ruminating heavily about my brother's passing, I could catch myself in that moment and go, okay, this is still true, but we don't need to pay attention to it right now. This is not the time Mm. and space to pay attention to it. So I found that becoming aware of my thoughts was key to changing them. Um, And then exercise. I've always, I mean, nobody likes exercise. I mean, some people like exercise, but for me, like it's never really been like my favorite thing to do. Um, I only used to exercise because I wanted to look a certain way, but once I stopped caring about how I looked and just go, okay, I I need to just get moving once a day. That's it. I just need to move for my health, um, for my mental health and for my physical health. I don't care what this ends up looking like at the end of the day. I just want to feel better. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was that mindset shift as well. It was just this perspective. Like, I'm not going to just struggle until I look a certain way because that goalpost is always going to move further over the horizon. It's always going to be something that I want to change. And so I just started doing things that were good for me and being a little bit selfish and just making myself my first priority because if I was going to support anybody else in my life, I had to support myself first. Um, And then I started doing things like journaling, I take a lot of care of my plants. So I take time to just disconnect, water my plants, give them a little misting, um, reading, drawing, all of these things I used to do and love that I just lost connection with in the busyness of life. Cool, cool, cool. So when you're at your lowest point, so we have exercise. Uh, Yes, the question is, what did you have to do to overcome or bounce back from your low points and then list the resources? But... So what I understand, based on what you're just saying, that when you were at some of your low points, you you exercised, um, plant therapy, um, yep. lots <laughs> of that. Was there any other resources that you can think of that were helpful to you to help you bounce back when you're at your lowest points? Reaching out to people. And just being really honest about what it was that I was going through. I am so grateful for my support system because when you have somebody that you can reach out to when you're feeling at your lowest and they either are just listening to you, maybe they're providing you with advice or maybe they're asking you what it is that you're looking for in that moment. Mm -hmm. Having somebody who understands as well is so vital. I find that most of the people that I have really close to me as a support system for my mental health also struggle with their mental health. So they understand what I'm going through. And so that we both have each other to lean on when we're going through that difficult time. Mm -hmm. A support system is huge um, because sometimes when you can't get out of bed to do the dishes or shower, any one of those basic tasks that people normally consider simple, um, your support system can be there to do that for you. Maybe pick something up for you, order dinner for you, I guess now that we're in COVID times, or just pick up the pieces that are really difficult for you to pick up at that moment is so vital. Um, And so, yeah, definitely a support system has been one of the most useful things for me in my lowest points. Okay. Yeah. I have to agree with you as well. I mean, when you have, when you have the right, right set of people that are around you to encourage you, speak life into you and just to be there, be a listening ear, that is just so helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. With that said, my next question is, um, what are three things you wish you had available when you were at your lowest point? Hmm. So number one is definitely accessible and affordable therapy. Um, I think this is like a huge problem for so many people, even people who do seek out therapy. Um, I, I wish that, I mean, I wish that it was accessible to me even now that I have come so far in my recovery journey. It's useful to everybody. And I really wish that I had had that um, just sort of an objective perspective outside of myself and maybe even my support system who would be able to help me through some of the things that I was experiencing. So definitely that. Um, Another thing is I would have really appreciated having worked for a business or an organization that understood that a mental health day is a really important reason to not come into work. Um, And I don't think I've ever worked at a company or business that has provided me with the support that I needed. Even after my brother passing and the grief and loss that I was experiencing, I didn't find that there was sympathy or understanding for taking time away to deal with what I was going through internally. Mm -hmm. Um, And then third, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I can't think of a third, to be honest with you. Um, probably just more, just more space, just a little bit more space in my life to be quiet and to step away. 
um, connect with family, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, those are some really good ones. Definitely. Um, the employer part, the having someone that's a bit more understanding, that that's important because um, I find that many employees don't, um, employers don't know how to support their employees but because they just don't, they, they just, you know, they're ignorant towards the fact that mental health is an issue and they don't, and it's still an individual, it's a invisible sickness that people can't see. So it's hard for them to, to, um, to relate and to be able to help people with their illnesses, I guess. Which yeah. Is- and this idea as well, that like, I'm going to be productive from Monday to Friday, nine to five, and I'm going to be on and ready mentally and physically every single week. It's just not realistic. You know, I can't, I can't withhold my, my trauma and emotional pain till the weekend. Like, I don't know that that's like a healthy thing to do. And so like, yeah, I, you know, what people are going through, doesn't adhere to any particular schedule. And to think that somebody needs to put out 40 hours a week, a productive work, over top of whatever they might be going through. You're not going to get the best work out of people. So it's true. It's yeah. true. Definitely. The next question I have for you is what words of hope can you give to our listeners, people who have gone through what you have gone through? And um, I guess maybe just need an encouraging word. What would you tell them? So many things. Um, first, even though I, I feel like for anybody who struggles with a mental health disorder, um, you know that recovery doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to have symptoms in the future and you're going to be cured of your mental illness. Um, but I think recovery for a lot of people just means managing the symptoms in your life better over time. And even though doing things like therapy, taking medication, exercise, meditation, all those things that you do for your mental health are so difficult near the beginning, it does get a little bit easier. It gets a little bit easier over time. The way I like to think about it is like as a video game, you start on level one, it's fairly easy. You have no weapons whatsoever in your arsenal. And so you get through it and then you get to the next level. Now you're equipped with a whole new skill level. You know what you're doing. It's a little bit more difficult, but you're more skilled and ready to take on the next level. Um, And so I know that it feels cyclically like there's always going to be stuff in life that's going to be bringing you down. And that's true. That's just the way that life is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But as you go along and you build these coping mechanisms, it does get a lot easier. It does get easier. And then you still feel the pain, but you know what to do to be able to mitigate it and strengthen yourself moving forward. Um, It always gets better. It always, always gets better. Um, and And I think it's difficult because for so many of us, what we look at is our past and we project our past onto our future to say, well, it's always been terrible. It'll always be terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think for most of us, like that's not the case for me five years ago when my brother passed away, I couldn't have imagined a future where I was happy and fulfilled and doing something that I loved um, because I was projecting my past onto my future. But now I'm in a space I never could have possibly dreamed of being. Um, And so it does get better, even though I know that that feels so empty to people, especially when they're going through a difficult time to hear it does feel better. It does get better, but in due time, it will get better. It'll get easier. Um, and you'll always find ways to find joy in your life. Even if it's in those small little moments, like watering your plants or having a quick chat with a friend or reading a really inspiring book, there are these beautiful moments in life. And if you pay attention to light, pay attention to them, they are definitely there. Amazing. Well, that's really some really great advice. Really great advice. So with that said, we are going to take a little switch in topic. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see behind me, there is a book and the book says um, the music of my life. So in that book, we basically, I talk about music therapy and my, my journey with bipolar disorder. So with that said, I'd like to know what type of music do you like? Oh, This is like such a, I'm one of those people where, so my brother um, was into music. He played guitar, he did music production, and he was just so unbelievably passionate about all types of music and sharing it with everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten into so many different types of music because of him. Um, I like everything. The only thing I'll say I don't like I don't know if this is controversial. It's just country music doesn't resonate. We're in the same boat. Yeah. (laughs) 
We're in the same boat. I'm sorry. Right? I, I no know. No offense to my country fans. No <laughs> offense. I'm sorry. I just, I just can't go down. I can't, just can't get down with it. I just no. Can't. It doesn't. It just doesn't resonate with my soul. I'm just. That's how much. It's just a personal thing. I know people right. who love it love it. Yes. But I just don't. I'm sorry. Right. That's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you're pretty eclectic. Yeah, I used to be a, a scene kid. I used to listen to a lot of heavy metal. So I, I come from that. You know, I like space my ears. I had the like long hair in the front, short in the back. So I was, I've been very passionate about music my whole life. Um, and then I sort of music to, moved into electronic music. Uh, things like drum and bass are, are still a favorite of mine, especially when I'm exercising. Mm -hmm. um, and then now I've gotten into a lot more like soul kind of R&B. And so like my music tastes have really like changed and developed over time. Um, but music is such an unbelievably healing thing in my life. Um, it's amazing how you can just hear a certain song and it just resonates with what you're going through at that moment. And yes. even like 10 years later in your life, you'll hear that song again and it'll bring you right back to wherever it was that you were with whoever you were with. So, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I love that about music where it can just, t it can take you to different places and, and it can speak to your, your 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 current situation whatever you're going through like I love that um it's that international language that you can just connect for me music is like it's a friend that knows me more than I know myself like that's yeah what, that's what music is for me so I love yeah. it with that said if you were to think of a song that best describes your journey what would it be and why Oh, hmm. Okay. There's so many songs that it's, it's difficult to, um, that it's difficult to, to figure out. I don't even remember what I ended up um, writing down because. Dreamer. Oh, by K Flay. That is such a great song. That is such a great song. Okay. Um, tell us what, tell us more about it. Uh, maybe even some of the lyrics. Feel free if you want to sing it. Uh, <laughs> I will save both you and I a little bit of pain by not singing that song out loud. Um, this song, it's funny because I had listened to this song a million times. Um, and then something just happened like five years later, where it was just this particular time in my life where I just heard, it's like, I heard the lyrics for the first time. And I, I don't know like what to attribute that to, but it was almost like, you know, like some sort of outside thing that was just pushing my attention towards the lyrics at this time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read some of the lyrics just, just for a brief second. Okay. Um, one of the things that really resonates with me is just, okay, hold on. I'm going to read it. I'm not, I'm not going to try to try to express it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so these are part of the lyrics. What would I do different if I hit rewind and did it again? I tried to figure it out, but nothing was coming to mind. Remembered all my mistakes, but the memories made me me smile. I told the one that I loved that love would mean letting me go, even though I was afraid you got to do some things on your own. Um, and I think that's just like such an amazing, I don't know, it, it just really like hits me in all the right places that you can do things on your own. And one of the other lyrics is I used to feel alone, I used to not belong, but little did I know I had the power all along. Ooh. And that just speaks to me because I, I really believe that first and foremost, we have to take care of ourselves and that in taking care of ourselves, we can take care of our communities. We can take care of our friends and we can do the things that we feel really passionately about. But if we're always putting ourselves on the back burner, none of that stuff is really going to get done and you're going to get burnt out. And so many different things are going to stand in your way. So if you take care of yourself and you really build a relationship with yourself, um, that you can achieve basically anything. I think we prioritize other people all the time. If I, if, if I were to, you know, have a good friend in my life, I would make plans with them. I would ask them how they're doing. I would check in on them when they're going through a difficult time, but people don't do that with themselves. And we're in a relationship with ourselves. And if you don't cultivate that relationship by yourself and you learn to be by yourself and you, you feel comfortable just sitting alone in silence by yourself, uh, it's going to be really difficult for you to find peace and harmony in your life. So I don't, I've never described my relationship to that song in such detail before, but yeah, that's, that's a really powerful one for me. Okay. Wow. That's <laughs> cool. Cool. Okay. Well, with that said, how can we stay in touch with you? What are your social media handles? 
So there's two um, for 2020 arts. Everything is 2020 arts. It's spelled out phonetically. So it's T-W-E-N-T-Y, T-W-E-N-T-Y arts. Uh, we're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest. I, I don't even know. There, there are probably more. Um, and then my personal Instagram is uh, Megan.keepingitreal. Uh, just a little play on my last name. Um, and that's basically it. I've been trying to build out my own personal, my own personal Instagram, but I've been really focused on 2020 arts lately. So. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, Megan, it has been a pleasure having you on our show. And I, I think people will be inspired by your message. And I'm looking forward to hearing the feedback of other people who have been on the, sh who actually, who are going to listen to this show and you know, comment and, you know, be able to connect with you. Thank so you. thank you so very much. So with that said, and to all you resilient minds out there until next time, please subscribe to us on all our platforms and don't forget to rate the show and leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts. Also join the community of resilient minds and sign up for our monthly newsletter at cleonycrawford.com. Be sure to grab a copy of my book, the music of my life on all Amazon marketplaces to get to know me better. And if you can think of one person that will receive value from today's show or connect with Megan's testimonial, please share it with them. Feel free to take a screenshot of this week's episode of the podcast and tag us on Instagram. You can tag myself at only Cleone or Resilient Minds 365 or and today's guest at 2020 Arts and uh keep it Megan dot keeping it real. Yeah. Yep, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And remember, mental health is not a death sentence. Despite your illness, you can strive, thrive, and live a life of abundance. Until next time, I'm Cleone Crawford and I'm signing off. Let's <laughs> go.